Good morning. I want to welcome you to the Rory Branson Legacy Sabbath School this morning. And today we have Calvin Thompson. He is a professor here at the School of Religion at Loma Linda University. He has been a pastor in Southern and Southeastern conferences. And uh, the last, the two I'm well aware of are Azure Hills and here at Loma Linda University Church. And so he is going to talk this morning, start off our series on Martin Luther. And I almost always want to add King Jr. But, um, <laughs> on Martin Luther. And so we want to welcome him uh, this morning. Yeah, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for a challenging and exciting and stimulating possibility of looking at the life of a great but flawed spiritual leader to see his life his contributions, and learn the lessons that are incredibly relevant for our lives today. Be with us through this journey, not just today, but through the next several weeks. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, I said that um, in connection with this, I'm probably more of a Methodist than a Lutheran in terms of the fact that my Sabbath school involvement is usually more like an itinerant um, sawdust trail preacher than somebody who regularly gets to be in one beautiful stone edifice or something. I teach classes all over campus, and so this is the one I am most likely to consider home base when I'm not teaching elsewhere. But when Dave asked me about some of the future ones, I said, you know, unfortunately my Sawdust Trail career for the next few weeks is pretty booked. I might be able to do some more with this, but I have a whole series of other Sabbath schools I'm going to be teaching for. So as I say, I kind of make the rounds. And, uh, but it's always fun to be here because this is the one I most likely to consider home base. This morning we begin a series on Martin Luther and certainly a passionate interest of mine. Actually my wife's as well. She did a master's thesis in church history and looked at the Protestant Reformation and its impact on the role of women in society how the theology of the Reformation impacted um, the, the role, the view of women, and certainly Martin Luther was a major part of that, and we see some ways in which his own contributions actually did impact, in a favorable way, the views of women, of family, and some of it accidental. He certainly never intended to be a married man, and as I will mention shortly, it's just one of those things that just happened. But we celebrate at this point 500 years of Reformation, and one thing I've sometimes said is that Martin Luther is particularly famous for saying things he never said. <laughs> and that's a little bit like what somebody once said about Shakespeare, is that I can't see what's so great about Shakespeare, he just took a bunch of well-known phrases and strung them all together, so what's so great about that? <laughs> Now, actually, with Luther, many of the things that are attributed to him, we don't know for sure what he did or said. There's at least some reason to believe that some of the stories are true. We don't always have direct record of them, but some of them are probably later editions. Some of them are attributed to some of his followers. For example, the famous story of the nailing of the thesis on the Wittenberg door goes back to Melanchthon. I think it was somewhere around 1545 or somewhere that the referent, we have the reference. And it may have happened in some way, and it might possibly have been similar to the well-known story, but Luther himself doesn't tell the story. And we do know that something happened that very quickly got Luther's 95 theses distributed throughout much of Germany, and they actually made their way to Rome in not too long. And one of the exciting things about it, of course, is the fact that we have an intersection of several social forces in the life of Luther, not the least of which was the printing press. And that's going to be one of my points, is that a lot of theological discussion, a lot of theology is actually very closely tied to cultural trends, and we'll go through several of them. The printing press is certainly one of them. And now when we're in another whole media revolution age where it's the internet that is impacting our means of disseminating ideas, there's no question that that's going to impact the way the church and theology happens. You can't divorce it from that. Uh, John Hus, who has had said some similar things to Luther, um, it's just one example, somebody who ended up not being able to disseminate his ideas nearly as widely as Luther did. But the Gutenberg printing press 
The German invention certainly had a lot to do with the spread of Luther's ideas. So what Luther actually did on that famous day, All Souls' Eve in uh, uh, Wittenberg, is still debated. We don't know for sure. Now, we do know that there were times when somebody would post a document for public display. And the document was intended to be more of a prompt to scholarly discussion than an actual, you know, kind of here I stand, um, mobilize the masses. So some of our paintings certainly are wrong. Where we have, you know, Luther striding to the front, nailing his document to the door, and on one hand, the horrified um, papists on the other hand, people longing for grace, and every, you know, some people cheering, some people booing, you know, Luther just striding, you know, heroically to the door. We know that's a misleading picture. That's not, whatever else we know, it didn't quite happen that way. But we don't know for sure what did happen. But we'll go, um, but it's still, that's an important point to look at as a transition point into the, the Protestant Reformation, because we do know that the document got very widely disseminated very quickly. And it did stir up a lot of discussion. It was originally written in Latin, so it was not just something for the common people to absorb and reflect upon, but it was clearly something that one way or another was part of a scholarly discussion. And we'll talk about some of the major points that prompted it in just, just a moment. But Luther is a fascinating character, you know, uh, very different from someone like, say, John Calvin, who is very methodical, organized, systematic, has the whole institutes, um, and I may have the name, but I'm not a Calvinist, but we'll get back into that. But Luther is a very colorful, impassioned character. I found one description in one of the biographies I was going through over the last few weeks. Um, it said, here are some of Luther's great impulses, a reverence for authority, a vehement spirit, a cutting wit, a special talent for obscenity, and most important, a contempt for human nature coupled with a profound and melancholy awareness of the body's fate at death. Now that's a little bit of a dark spin to Luther, but you will discover that there are indeed elements of all of those if you read his writings, and there's an awful lot of stuff he wrote. I'm just kind of scratching my head and saying, did Ellen White read this when she was writing Great Controversy? <laughs> I mean, part of what is called the, um, the talent for obscenity. He did have a, a, an astonishing preoccupation with cer certain body functions, and some of those references were, uh, you know, infiltrate a lot of his, his writing, including his theological writing. So it's interesting the, the kind of earthiness of, of Luther. You would not have found that from John Calvin. But uh, Luther grew up in a day in an era, in a place that was filled with dark, forbidding images of human nature, and particularly the mortality of human nature. We find even in the artwork, especially in the Germanic area, eras, I should have bought some pictures I could have shown on the, the slideshow. I just figured I'd not, you know, just go with um, difference what I sometimes do in class with PowerPoints. But fascinating just to see the art. We do know that there are very graphic depictions of people being dragged to hell, of demons gnawing off people's legs, ripping off their arms, chewing on their faces. And we there's a whole nother genre that was becoming quite popular in about the hundred years before Luther did his thing which was the contrasting works of art, where you had, say, uh, young, beautiful people partying, celebrating, kind of doing their thing. And the meat in the background, you could see these ghouls and demons and skeletons and reminders of human mortality that were just there hovering in the background, ready to snatch up these young revelers and drag them off to hell or to remind them of the fragility of, of life and the reality of death. So this, this particular, what might call a totentance, death dance, art was just very prevalent um, in especially the northern Germanic areas. We see a lot of it certainly in the other, like the cathedrals, if you pay close attention to the art, you'll notice you know, there's a, there's a lot of hell going on in some of those, and a lot of destruction and ripping apart of human beings, dragging them, kicking and screaming down to hell. And, but this particular form where you had these, you know, more beautiful, alive revelers celebrating the goodness of life with this particularly dark, forbidding background. 
that was a genre of art that was particularly prevalent around the time that, you know, that Luther was growing up. And he certainly grew up in some pretty austere circumstances, although not as poor as some people. His father was a copper miner, and more than anything wanted his son to be a lawyer. Now, something I can relate to, my dad was also quite disappointed when I decided to go into theology instead of law. So I have something in common with Luther. My dad absolutely had his heart set on me becoming a lawyer. Now, he never got to see his granddaughter, my daughter, who's finishing her third year of law school, and um, that's, you know, she, she did it, but that was unfortunately passed. Uh, and actually, my older brother did as well, but my dad, it was me that my dad really had his eye on. You were going to be, I was going to be the lawyer. So I have something in common with, with Luther in the sense that I disappointed my father by going into theology instead. But actually, Luther did end up studying law. And his father was proud. We find some examples of Luther celebrating with some of his friends, you know, a few drunken revelries, uh, which, by the way, did not stop after he joined them, um, you know, later on in his career. But, um, you know, Luther having some fun, being part of the whole law school scene, always a little bit more conscientious and worried than some of his colleagues. But we do know that, you know, he followed his dad's instructions or desires, was living out the family dream. And then something happened. He was on a, uh, in a, on a, you know, using the words of Snoopy, it was a dark and stormy night. He was caught on a road um, and lightning struck. Didn't strike him, but was striking all around him. And he cried out, help me Saint Anne and I will become a monk. But you know, who is Saint Anne? Yeah, Mary's mother. So anyway, he actually followed through on his promise. You know, he was, he was terrified. He said, help me, St. Anne, I will become a monk. Uh, not unlike what a lot of people do in terms of, you know, experiences of adversity. They make promises to God. I'm always interested in working with people who end up going into ministry after some major life crisis because that's not always a good sign of what's going to happen next. But Luther actually did follow through on it. Um, and there's an actually very poignant image it was described of Luther's legal friends accompanying him to the monastery. They were baffled. What on earth is going on? What's happened to him? And that was actually considered a rather despicable career by many people. And certainly the, the lawyers would have looked at that as you know, very, very askance. I mean, would not have understood at all why would anybody who had a bright, promising career in law want to become a monk. The monks were considered, among other things, to be freeloaders. People who couldn't make it in any other area of life and just basically escapists. And so when they accompanied Luther and said goodbye, they probably had this idea they would never see him again. And that somehow or another he had gone off the deep end and they wanted to do everything they could to at least kind of understand what was going on, but finally realizing that was, that was beyond them. But we do know when Luther got into the, um, oh, actually one thing I should say before. <laughs> it's interesting the way that the monasteries and religious orders did function in society in general. Um, one other little interesting bit of illumination. Since arranged marriages were pretty much the norm in much of society, um, a woman who was considered, quote, unmarriageable was often sent to a convent. Or if her parents matched her up with somebody she didn't want to marry, she could freely join a convent. One of the, one of the very few ways that she could get out of the marriage she did not want. Now, there was another one uh, even more interesting, that if a woman was matched up to a man that she did not want to marry, she could get out of it by marrying a dead man. And what we mean by that is if she could go through the community roles, uh, you know, the list, uh, uh, and find the name of a man who had never been married, even if he was dead, she could get married to him, and then she wouldn't have to marry the guy she didn't want to marry. So anyway, we discover you know, that the convents, monasteries is, are, you know, are part of a larger way of kind of escaping from things that were too difficult. Also, if you were a younger brother, you sometimes had the, since you didn't get the inheritance uh, in most cases, although there's some interesting differences in, in Luther's time. 
But uh, uh, sometimes younger brothers who would miss, uh, wouldn't get the family inheritance would end up joining a monastery or they could become a knight and go out and joust for a living. But the idea was most likely they wouldn't then be a financial drain upon their families. So anyway, you just see some of the background behind <laughs> monasteries. And, you know, this is not necessarily considered the most illustrious career. And we discover Luther just agonizing, you know, lying on the cold floor, going through various forms of penance. We find the account of Martin Luther making the pilgrimage to Rome. And a you know, long story, the reasons he was um, selected to do that. But part of what we've discovered there is Luther's own temperament and personality. Descriptions were that, you know, of the people who went with him, most of them were kind of like, wow, you know, it's like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but, you know, the, the nightlife, the revelries, the, um, you know, the women of ill repute, the commercialism, the fun, you know, but Luther was horrified. Luther was absolutely horrified at what he saw. And um, one movie maker, actually a Luther movie maker from a movie about 10 years ago, uh, Life of Luther, actually depicts you know, Luther kind of being shoved through all these um, lines of you know, indulgences and penance and everything, next, next, next. You know, Luther's taking this very seriously. And um, you know, the famous Scala Sancta supposedly, um, you know, which had been sent to Rome from Jerusalem, the stairs that were reputed to be the ones that you know, Jesus had actually climbed. And the idea was if you went to the top, you got you know, a special indulgence for doing so. And the popular version is that at the top, Luther got this illumination from heaven. The just shall live by faith. But more likely, he simply said, who knows whether these kinds of things are so. So he began to question. And on a moment, I'll talk about indulgences, because there is a, uh, you know, indulgences were a product line as was purgatory. <laughs> purgatory was a product line. It was a sales I mean, There were a lot of reasons to hang on to, to purgatory. You know, Erasmus said you know, that that was the biggest reason people were afraid to let go of the theology of purgatory is because it was such a good product line. It was profitable. You could make a good living off of purgatory. But you know, indulgences, ways of you know, a penance, and that has a long history in itself. But then, um, Anyway, Luther um, was troubled by what he saw, and so you see something about just the, the role of, I mean, I hate to psychologize religion. I know Eric Erickson did way too much with Luther and tried to Freudianize him. But there's no question about it that our own temperaments do impact how we view religion. And Luther was different from the other people in his, I mean, from his colleagues even, in terms of how, you know, the, the incredible conscientious temperament that he had. And his confessor, Staupitz, at one point just finally said, well, why don't you come up with some real sins? Because you know, Luther would go through all these confessions, and you know, was, uh, at some point, Staupitz just became exhausted with all the details that Luther would go through. Well, let's move fast forward to Luther's now a uh, uh, theology professor uh, in Wittenberg. He's done some lectures on the Psalms. You know, we find Luther, you know, a whole series, Romans, Galatians, and so forth. Um, Luther's theology evolved. It wasn't like, you know, he, he talks about something called the Tower Experience, but we're still not totally sure what that was and to what degree it was a you know, particular punctiliar point in time and to what degree Luther's theology evolves. Because his commentary in Romans, for example, in later times, he does not refer to as, you know, the magnum opus of his theology. It sort of fades away. So he, apparently he believed he had come up with a lot of new insights since he had written his commentary on Romans. Um, but an event launched by a Dominican friar named Johann Tetzel. Now, Tetzel had been peddling indulgences for 15 years. The Dominicans were considered particularly, you know, kind of the itinerant, lowlifes, um, you know, being a peddler of indulgences would not have been considered a particularly unusual role for a Dominican. Uh, because they were, you know, they were kind of dependent on the rest of society and everything. 
Um, Tetzel, actually, there, you, know, you read some of his own writings. He, you know, he was quite sincere and impassioned about some of it. But a lot of the background was just simply the finances. Tetzel was part of the Church Building Fund fundraising committee. <laughs> and he was actually caught between two different political forces. One was Leo X, and the other one was Albrecht of Mainz. And both of them needed a lot of money. And they had actually worked out an agreement where by Tetzel and others selling indulgences, uh, they would split the take 50-50. Tetzel got an income as well, but um, Leo and Albrecht would split the take. And they both needed money desperately. Partly Albrecht had actually had to buy his bishop bishopric. And we know that that was a source of income, but in order to get it, you know, it was very much very political. It was like, you know, buying a seat on the exchange, or, you know, you read about the New York Stock Exchange. But buying a bishopric, you know, you, you were kind of setting yourself up for life, but you had to come up with a lot of money in the meantime. It was not a particular religious thing at all, but he, he was absolutely, you know, uh, you know, he'd gone around borrowing money and everything, and he needed the money bad. So Tetzel, you know, as I say, his work splitting the take. Uh, Leo X is another incredibly interesting character because Leo was pope, but didn't even come up to the normal priestly ranks. He was a Medici, uh, part of the family there, very much an art connoisseur, uh, was very much enjoying decorating his royal palaces with the very finest art and tapestries and so forth, and spending a lot of money just on that. To the point, it's, at some points, he had to actually hawk Vatican furniture to raise the money for what he was doing. But also as a patron of the saint, you know, the foundation uh, to St. Peter's was all laid out there, and he wanted to finish St. Peter's, or at least start it. I mean, just the foundations were laid, and that was his big project. And I, you know, I love going through St. Peter's, the beauty, the majesty, but, you know, that cost a lot of money. You know, you look at the building fund pictures we have here, um, you know, <laughs> not like St. Peter. So uh, Pope Leo, who had maxed out his uh, visa card on all sorts of things, he needed a lot of money. Money for his own extravagant expenditures, money to finish St. I mean, to actually get St. Peter's actually, you know, the design finished. Um, fascinating story of Bramante and Michelangelo and all those. <laughs> The building of, of St. Peter, I mean, even the architecture of St. Peter's. Um, but he needed money really badly. And so um, he, he, I can't imagine anything that would be more agonizing to him than having to deal with the Reformation. Because that was his not, not on his job description for being Pope. You know, building St. Peter's, absolutely. Being a connoisseur of the arts, absolutely. Going out on hunting expeditions, absolutely. But there was not a whole lot of theology in that. So the last thing he wanted to do was get involved in a bunch of theology. So anyway, Tetzel was going around selling in, um, you know, these, um, then we get into the whole theology of purgatory and how that developed. But it, it developed in part to deal with the lapsi, the, you know, the people who had lapsed during the times of persecution. And then there had been the true Christians whose blood was shed and then there were the people who had lapsed, and the question was, how can we restore them to full belonging in the early church, or fairly early church, when they had lapsed in their faith? And so the idea was those who had shed their blood in the sand of the you know, Roman gladiator arenas, you know, that there must be some way of kind of, of capturing their virtue. And then you had the whole idea of the treasury of merit, the idea that certain saints had done so much that was incredibly virtuous, and then, then you had a whole another group of people who, at the last day, who, who needed to have that virtue imparted to them. And so it kind of developed over time. You had the whole, you know, gradually the idea became that it wasn't just a way of doing a form of penance, but it didn't take forever for the powers to be to learn that it was a particularly productive product line. You make a lot of money on indulgences. And in order to make it work, you had to have a theology of purgatory. And so that was a way to give an added context to indulgences. And purgatory kind of goes back, I mean, there's a text in Maccabees that is sometimes used, you know, um, 
to justify the belief in purgatory. People agreed it wasn't directly found in scripture. But we also find in reference uh, St. Augustine praying for his parents. And so that was part of the rationale for purgatory. Then the whole, you know, over time you can trace the development of purgatory. And so as I say, purgatory itself became a great product line. And so you get at the time of Luther, here's Leo who's maxed out his credit cards, um, needs to build St. Peter's, great connoisseur of the arts. You have Albrecht of Mainz who has to pay off a whole lot of money because of the bishopric he had purchased. And the agreement with Tetzel will, spl uh, will, spend, will split the take 50-50. And so you know, Tetzel is apparently uh, you know, the Tony Robbins of the era and you know the slick salesman kind of type. And as I say, he'd been peddling indulgence for 15 years, and so by the time he, uh, it wasn't in Wittenberg itself, but you know, by the time he, he landed in the, uh, uh, the area, um, he was kind of the ultimate slick salesman. Anybody remember the famous saying uh, ascribed to Tetzel? Something about a coin, yeah. Yeah. copper rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Yeah, when the coin in the coffers um, rings, a soul from purgatory springs. So um, that was interesting because Tetzel's, I mean, Tetzel has some absolutely astonishing ways of describing it. I mean, you could deflower the Virgin Mary, and if you bought an indulgence, I mean, nothing like that had been said in quite that graphic and disturbing language before. But anything he could do to sell these indulgences was considered fair game. Now, comment? Just, does that work in German? Uh, yeah, that's what um, I, I've actually tried to find that find that out. I, um, it, we know almost for sure there's at least some embellishment, you know, of some sort. So the poetic form, my take is probably an English embellishment on it. You know, that that was. Um, the, but there was actually another interesting. Um, take on that, so when the coin falls in the pitcher, the Roman sea grow, grows even richer. But we also know that in uh, 1515, um, Leo had put in some kind of expiration date on a lot of existing indulgences because a lot of people said, hey, I got them. I got what I need. So it was like, you know, putting the toaster back down, you know, nope, sorry, you, know, you need to buy a new one. And that was part of the background as well, trying to create the um, setting for more sale of indulgences. And so that is what really launched Luther. You know, the original document, wherever it was posted, uh, which got widely disseminated because of the printing press, primarily not so much about the Roman papacy itself. You know, we watched that occur over time. But a big part of it was just the whole thing about indulgences and challenging the theology of indulgences. And, um, you know, even we discover later on, got much into a, you know, debating purgatory, debating um, the the role of you know the papacy and got into some very 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 inflammatory dialogue. Well, so much more I could do. I want to um, sum up a few of my own conclusions and then um, at least I mean some of my initial thoughts on the contributions of Luther and the Reformation, and then we can open it up for some discussion on you know well who is Luther? What is his contribution? Um, Something I did not mention, um, marriage. Luther had not intended to be a married man, but in order to understand something about Luther, we have to look at the story of Catherine von Bora, who was um, a group of, uh, one of a group of nuns that had escaped from a nunnery and landed in Wittenberg, and all the others had gotten married off. And there was actually some attempts to marry her off to some other people. And I I'm, I'm don't remember for sure all the reasons that didn't work. But um, finally, it got the point of, you know, there was Luther and there was Katie von Bora. And um, he was not sure what to do about this. I um, mean, for, for one thing, he not, had not intended to be a married man. And the other thing is that he thought she was too headstrong and stubborn. So in response to that, she proposed to <laughs> And they got married, and we do see another side of, of Luther, and you know, he had talked about how he had spent his life sleeping on damp straw, and all of a sudden what it was like to actually wake up in the real, a real bed with real sheets that weren't damp straw, and pigtails 
on the pillow next to him. She is a remarkable woman. I mean, just to read her accounts of, of how she you know, raised both their own children, some children of family members, and even a few that were not, and fed the large number of disciples who gathered to listen to Luther. And the way she ran the garden, um, the farm, and that lady was amazing. And so much of what Luther was able to later contribute in the table talks and such, it really goes back. I don't know how he would have done it without her, but it did, in fact, contribute to a more positive understanding of marriage, family, of the role of women, um, you know, still in some ways what we might call a traditional role, but it did change the, the view of women. Um, I probably wouldn't be complete without mentioning, though, also, um, you know, Luther, um, the, the kidnapping of Martin Luther in friendly hands, um, being stuck away in Wartburg Castle, uh, the fact that while Luther was gone from Wittenberg, um, a lot of nefarious, I mean, this, some strange things happened, beginning the process that um, really created a lot of division. It was interesting because Tom, Thomas More had been very afraid of a reformation because he said that if we do anything like that, all sorts of things will, you know, people will be going all different directions. And if we don't have Mother Church, who knows what people will do. And in fact, a lot of what Thomas More said, actually you can see it happen. Even you know, um, Karl Schott and others, while Luther was gone, Luther came back, you know, uh, as uh, Junker George, basically, with a beard, came back into town, came in, you know, there's a new sheriff in town to clean up what was going on in Wittenberg. But, you know, you just see all kinds of uh, permutations of the Ref Reformation play out. Um, Henry VIII, who got into it more for marital and political reasons, which, by the way, was a factor. People were resentful of the amount of money being sent to Rome as well as the fact that Rome owned a lot of land in all these different Re uh, Reformation countries. And they discovered, you know, if you could have a Reformation, you got the land back and you didn't have to keep sending money to Rome. So there was another set of, of motivations for it. Um, and the way all that plays out. And then you, you, but unfortunately, we saw a whole series of, of wars going on, you know, conflicts, some of it directly religious. You saw the peasant revolt, uh, you know, Luther himself coming down against what he called the schwärmer, the, the swarmers, the, the peasants, and actually, you know, in, in opposing the peasants who figure this is finally the day when our time has come. You know, populist revolt, and that was not what Luther had in mind. He came down on that, uh, against that. Um, we also noticed things like some of Luther's comments on the Jews, and, you know, it's just, there are some, you know, some dark and unfortunate sides. Um, just a few conclusions. As I say, I intended to um, throw this open a little bit earlier, but let me let me just go through some of the things I think are significant. I mean, certainly one of them is the priesthood of all believers. And there's a lot of ways we can illustrate this. Interestingly enough, a lot of it came in terms of the whole issue of ordination, which Luther said was not a biblical sacrament. He, um, and he had some, that was the one that was the most serious of the sacraments that he questioned, was the whole notion of ordination. He said ordination is Roman, it's not, um, he had his own way of setting up priests and so forth eventually. But um, that was certainly a major contribution and one of his big Reformation quarrels with Rome was over uh, the sacraments, the priesthood of all believers, the roles of the priests who were transmitters of grace, and um, the notion that you know certain people would could be ordained, and that the ordained people were the you know the, the higher religious authorities who had power over everybody else. But I want to give you a kind of a popular um, you know a, 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 something you may not have thought of about a different dimension to understanding the priesthood of all believers, and that's another interesting contribution of Martin Luther, which was hymns. I, mean, I love the music of Frescobaldi and Gabrielli and um, you know, some of the um, antiphonal you know, Renaissance music or Gregorian chants. I love it. Beautiful music. But the fact is it was performance music by and large. Luther, one of the things that really illustrated the priesthood of all believers was singing hymns together in church. 
And you didn't have to be a magnificent soloist or whatever in order to do that, although Garrison Keillor tells the story of the Lutheran lady who uh, likes to th think uh, in the choir who thought she was a much better singer than she was. So I don't know where the priesthood of believers all factor to that. But uh, Luther did talk about that. I mean, the, I look at the, the singing of hymns and the music, even you know, a lot of box music, is really a part of the, the legacy of the Lutheran Reformation. But the fact that people would all sing it together. Luther is known as much as anything for his hymns. I, I kind of like that as an illustration of the priesthood of all believers. You sing it together rather than just listening to the magnificent um, performance of a choir. Uh, sola Scriptura, another you know, major contribution. It's interesting, though, we think about it in terms of, um, I, mean, I like when Pastor Randy talked about it in the context of what we call the Wesleyan quadrilateral, not the idea that, that Scripture is the only authority. You can learn nothing from experience or tradition or you know, some various other aspects. Um, you know, the work of the Spirit and such, but that there is a primacy to the Bible, a way that the Bible emerges as a central reality. But I have a symbol for that as well, which was the published version of the Lutheran Bible. Luther, in his Bible, shaped the entire German language. The German language we have really was shaped by Luther's Bible. Luther translated the Bible into the vernacular, but it wasn't just the vernacular. What it was was a way of unifying some of the various dialects across Germany and pulling it all together into one scripture that ended up unifying the German language. But here's an interesting illustration for that. In that particular era, the Lutheran Bible was usually the only book that most families had. Sola Scriptura? Well... It was. It was the only book they had. And Luther wanted to design his Bible, not just in the vernacular, so families could read it, like some of us remember the Bible stories being read, but he actually wanted to make sure there were woodcuts, illustrations, and introductions that could be accessible to children. And so it was something that actually shaped all of the family's religious education, and it was also designed so you could lay it on a table and it would stay open. And it's fun to look back at some of those um, woodcuts, and uh, you know, he says, for his vocabulary, he said, we must ask the mother in the home and the children in the street. And so the pictures have like a camel, a crocodile, and a toad in the Garden of Eden, and um, half a million have been printed by the middle of the century. Half a million. So I like that as an illustration of sola scriptura because that's, you know, you can imagine the Lutheran Bible sitting out there open for the family and just the centrality of the Bible. I mentioned women, home, and marriage. I mentioned technology. You know, the Luther, the Lutheran Reformation would not have happened without the technology of the age. And that has some interesting implications for society today. Um, justification and sanctification. Now, there's some interesting complexities. What Luther believed is not always exactly what we think he believed. I've also pointed out in other contexts, it's not necessarily the same as the emphasis in the Apostle Paul. Luther was very um, obsessed with predestination, for example, and was actually fighting those. People like Thomas More or Erasmus, he did not like Erasmus, which is too bad, because I identify more with Erasmus than Luther, because I'm more of a, you know, let's reason it out, let's look all the sides of this. Luther did not like that. But um, Luther actually, you know, some of his justification by faith was actually defense of absolute predestination in the sense that um, you don't even have a spark that can respond to God. Nothing would happen without basically God doing everything. But that was the only way, if you look at Luther, his agony, his fear of death, which permeates a lot of his writings. That was one way for him. It was a, uh, a, a seeking for assurance. And actually, I like a lot of what he did with it. I just wanted to point out, though, it is not necessarily exactly what we think it was. And Luther's emphasis, I also mentioned, is different from, you know, different from Paul's. But l l listen to this. Is whenever the devil pesters you with these thoughts, and this is thoughts that you're going to be lost, that you're going to die, you know, eternal death, he says, seek out the company of men, drink more, joke, and jest, and engage in some other form of merriment. We shall be overcome if we worry too much about falling into sin. When the devil throws our sins up to us and declares that we deserve death or hell, we ought to speak thus. I admit that I deserve death and hell, but what of it? 
For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Where he is, there I shall be also. So you can't understand Luther without, without understanding that absolutely powerful Christological focus. And his view, even though it was so tied into, you know, that there are the elect and the non-elect, uh, different from Calvin's way of doing it, by the way. But, you know, the idea that we don't even have a spark that can respond to God. It's all of God and all of grace. Um, even the initial spark, that unless God reaches out with that, you can't even, you know, you can't even decide to respond. But in that, there is an incredible Christological focus. And I think the one thing I would just say on that is, what I take away from that is, if you are ever worried too much about your faith, you've missed the boat. Or your salvation, I should say, or how you're doing with God. If you don't remember anything else about, so, uh, about uh, justification by faith, remember that. That above all, Luther, a deeply troubled, anxious person about his salvation, really struggling for his place, you know, was he going to face eternal death? By the way, he wasn't at all sure that there was a real hell. It was more about eternal loss and the darkness and the separation. But the, 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 the overarching conclusion of that is for any wor worried soul, if you worry too much about that, remember that voice that's whispering in your ear is not God, it's the devil. And the best way to fight back against the devil is not to argue with him or defend yourself or to give in to despair. I mean, I like his first part. Basically, don't be afraid to be with people. He's, you know, he talks about the, 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 the value of just getting out and embracing life. But just use a little bit of paradoxical stuff with the devil. Okay, I agree with you, but so what? I have Jesus, and that's all that matters. And that's, that's incredibly powerful. Um, the fact that we, I do think we can't talk about Luther without talking about the dark side, though. Um, some of what he said about the Jews, some of the way he entangled, even with the Roman papacy, and you're going to be reading the Babylonian captivity of the church. Um, one of the things we know about that is that's kind of when some of the division was considered absolute, because the way he attacked the papacy, the way he attacked... Um, I mean, there's there a lot of stuff that was happening there. Um, Luther could be divisive. And we do see the way that plays out. And I suppose, I could go through a lot of examples, how it led up, you know, even to the Thirty Years' War, so forth. But it, one of the sobering lessons I take away from it is how quickly religion turns into combat. How quickly it turns into my tribe against your tribe. And we see that in the way the whole Reformation played out, his debates with Zwingli, his differences with, you know, Erasmus, with, with Calvin, with um, Thomas More, with the way he handled some of the, the issues with the Roman papacy. I can understand it. I, 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 I say I realize part of my perspective is I'm probably more like Erasmus. I'm much more in terms of... Let's, I, you know, I, will, I want to be more reasonable. I want to look at all the different sides of things. And there were some things that happened that were good because of the way Luther did, but there was a lot of carnage as well. And I just think that's a, at least a lesson for us, that religion can get very ugly very fast. It can get very tribal very fast, you know, our side against your side. There does seem to be a human impulse toward that. Interestingly enough, even with all the statute debates in our society today, there's a very interesting parallel. When all the statues of Luther in Germany got put up, it was not right after the Reformation. It was a time more German nationalism. So we assume they're all statues just to celebrate the Reformation. They were a lot of them uh, at a point when nationalism was gaining ascendancy. So the statues had a different context. So that has some implications as well. Um, and finally, I would just say, you know, all the solas, one of my takeaways is keep it simple. There are a lot of other things that can illuminate Jesus Christ. I definitely believe in uh, a lot of the, way, uh, the values of, say, doctrinal study and so forth. I think that studying more, illuminating that is, is important. But part of what Luther is saying is it's sort of like the, there's a whole decluttering movement in terms of houses and garages and so forth. 
think we need it, but anyway. Our parents' generation really needs it. But <laughs> also we were talking about why uh, people who want to, uh, their grandkids to inherit all their big furniture and the grandkids don't want it. But there's a whole decluttering movement, but I think we could actually bring it into theology as well. Let's, know, let's at least know how to keep first things first. That doesn't mean that, that the rest can't have a real important role, but Luther said, let's, let's make sure we know what's really important. Uh, finally, never stop moving forward, growing, believing, putting God back in. Because one of the things that several biographers I was looking at say one thing Luther really did. He said, whatever else, you know, church is often about money, about personalities, about building projects, about politics, everything else like that. And not about God, not about Jesus Christ. And one of the, his great passions said, let's make that, make Jesus Christ the guiding light. Well, as I said, I did my part a little longer than I intended. Uh, any just general questions or comments or things anybody would like to let's see? I guess we don't have lots of time. But, um, yeah, there's a hand back there. The history of uh, Reformation is a fascinating one. If we want to, to learn more details about that, we have to read Daubigny's mm -hmm. History of the Reformation. It's a French historian. He is very detailed about uh, uh, Reformation. You mentioned uh, the preoccupation with the, the death. That mm -hmm. was not just happening. It was related with the Black Death, which was affecting Europe starting in 1300. And it happened in a few Sequences, I mean a few times, two, three times, and decimated one third approximately of the population of Europe. Another thing that to, to put Reformation in, in larger context, we have to may, may, uh, mention the Renaissance. Yes. Uh, the Renaissance started in Italy, but spread throughout Europe, and uh, it affected also the church. Uh, it was uh, uh, a renewed interest in the values of Greek, uh, Roman culture, architecture, literature, especially philosophy. In these universities, were studied more Plato and Aristotle than, than the Bible. Well, the Bible actually was very rare. In the libraries, it was chained to the pupitre, to the desk, because it was so rare. But um, uh, the... Uh, what, what happened with the indulgence is directly related with the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. uh, Lyotel was, uh, was a Renaissance pope. Absolutely. And before, yeah, before him, family. Julius II, he turned the Basilica of St. Peter, which was built by Constantine the Great in the fourth century, the and, yeah. and uh, the papacy was basically financially bankrupt mm -hmm. and needed a lot of money. In addition to what you mentioned about um, Leo X being a great collector, he was more interested in, in art and, and than, than basically in the spiritual things. Actually, his reaction when he, he had on his desk uh, Luther's 95 Theses was very interesting. He read them and he said, well, this Dr. Luther, he is a fine genius. But of course, that was his first re uh, reaction because after, afterwards he saw how Luther's uh, thesis spread throughout uh, Germany and throughout Europe and the damage that was doing to the Catholic Church. Very quickly, to enlarge the, the, the uh, um, framework of the Reformation, we have to mention also that the Catholic Church was decadent at that time. Uh, the monks didn't know how to read and write. They, most of them didn't know how to say the Mass. Uh, that was said uh, basically in Latin. Latin was even the, the language of the Renaissance now. And uh, uh, simony was practiced on a wide scale. They, they were selling and buying uh, uh, church jobs. Nepotism was, uh, was practiced there also. Uh, 13, 15 years uh, people were uh, declared by popes their nephews and the relatives right. cardinals. And, we yeah, no, I, I actually, several one. good points you raise. I think it builds on what I was saying. I mean, number one, to realize that, yes, the rest of the Renaissance was happening uh, in Italy and other places. Interestingly enough, the very year that Luther 
had his help me say it Anne, and I will become a monk experience, that was the year that the David statue went up. So there was humanism and a whole new discovery of the, uh, you know, a, a revision of the role of the human, the, a new optimism that, and artistic fervor that had, was started in the South and hadn't yet really gotten up into the, to the northern Germanic areas yet. That's a very important part of the context was the Renaissance. And certainly, like, you know, Leo X was very much a part of that. You also mentioned the plague, the Black Death definitely part of where some of the obsession with death and plague and destruction um, came from. Uh, all the politics you mentioned, I think there were a couple other things, but yes, I think all of those help illuminate the, the, the context. So yeah, thank you for that, um, yeah. I have three brief points. First of all, I'm hoping that next week we can come back and hear Luther talk about Calvin, since we had Calvin talking about Luther today. <laughs> um, but I think that the, the psychological framework of what was going on was the church was in a period of oppressing the people mm -hmm. for financial purposes and for others. And the doctrine of purgatory, I mean, what could be scarier than that? Your mother's down in purgatory, she's going to go to hell unless you pay money. So they had people, you know, in a very vulnerable position. And I think it built up a climate of sort of paranoia, spiritual mm -hmm. paranoia. and. Oppression never lasts forever. Eventually, the oppressed classes will strike back. Right. And this had to happen. And one of the ways they oppressed was the teaching of purgatory, but there were many, many others. And so Luther was kind of like the guy who went through the system, gave himself totally to the system, discovered from the inside that the system was full of abuses and full of things that did not accord with Scripture, and had to break down walls to make that point that people are a lot freer in Christ. Mm -hmm. than the church would ever have had them believe. It didn't suit their political ends or their financial ends to have people know that they are free in Christ. The last thing I think uh, my best takeaway from what you said today was um, Luther in having his discourse with the devil about his soul, that would be something that would be very common in that kind of a, of a climate, a religious climate. Um, when I was a little kid, I grew up going to evangelistic meetings and seeing pictures of King Jesus coming in the clouds. But here in the foreground were all the wicked running away. You know, it scared, scared the liver out of you when you were a little kid. And, see that. and um, Luther, in coming to have his dialogue with the devil, finally he did a very zen-like martial arts type of move. He agreed with it. Yes, I deserve right. hell. I deserve to be lost eternally. But I have Jesus. And I think that's the, the strongest thing that can be said out of his teaching. We have Jesus, we've got it all. Yeah, and I, I totally concur, and that's, as I hope, the biggest takeaway. One other comment I do want to make, though, just to build on that. Part of what uh, Jim was talking about has to do with the fact that religious organizations often become very political, and it can happen to any of them. And lose sight, because self-preservation is the natural impulse of any organization. And so I want to point out that we can talk about us versus them, but rather than doing that, it's, you know, it's what, like the statement of Pogo, we have met the enemy and you know, he is us, or they are us, that it's better to realize just that's, that's a process that can happen anywhere. Religious organizations become very political. Um, there were a number of people who were working toward reformation. So it wasn't like everybody who was, all these insiders were doing one thing, and then here's Luther, the courageous outsider. Luther never intended to be an outsider. By temperament, he ended up that way. But you know, people like, you know, I mentioned several others that were much more reformed from, from within. But it just shows the, the, the challenges and the dangers of organizations, uh, especially religious organizations, because it doesn't just feel like you're fighting for you know, Microsoft versus Apple or whatever. It feels like, more like you're fighting for, for, for God. And so it's easy to, to kind of conflate organizational survival issues with the actual God issue. And that's something I think that all of us need to think about. Let's see how we're doing time. Just uh, maybe, yeah, you know, we've got a little more time here. I'll, okay, right here. Okay, so I just read the most fascinating biography on Martin Luther. It is on the New York Times bestseller list called Martin Luther by Eric Metaxas. And just a couple of takeaways. He willed all of his estate to his mother. It was, it was normal practice to will it to your oldest son. Mm -hmm. But he said, no, I don't want my mother, my wife, I'm sorry, 
take it back. He willed it to Katie, right. his wife, because he didn't want Katie to be beholden to his children. Mm. So mm -hmm. that, that was an important step, I think, in terms of women's uh, uh, liberation. Also, in terms of the, uh, the importance of Luther's contribution to music, it's interesting that I think the Protestant church as a musician, I, I have to say that maybe they took it to the extreme in replacing the art of the Catholic Church with these right. huge, expensive pipe organs, and, you know, converting the cathedrals, taking down the artwork, and, and then replacing it with very, yeah, very expensive A number of examples of that, the, the art all painted over, but this huge pipe organ, and also the pulpit. Now, the pulpit was took the place of the, you know, the table for the sacraments, and so with the idea that the word was the the sacramental, and but then you have in a lot of the European churches these huge pipe organs, which I love too. Yes. I love the art, I love the pipe organs. Yes. I love the, I love the so anyway, it's it's hard for me just to stand back and think about all the the, the context of all the wars that went into all that because I say I, I. One last thing is the 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 impact of this book on me spiritually. The the thing that Luther uh, towards the end of his life said, uh, you know, I have it was towards the end of his life, and he said. He had a lot of people there that were visiting him. He was a popular guy. Mm -hmm. said, well, very have, well. Yeah, very much. I yeah, have to go up to my room and pray. It was 8, a, uh, 8 p.m. He always went to his room and spent mm -hmm. time with God. So that's inspiring to me. Yeah. So along with the humanity, there's so much that really is inspiring. As I say, I sometimes say it's good to look at the, both the, the, the word and the flesh and the context. Um, you know, as I say, Luther existed within the context of everything from rising nationalism, economic forces, human, humanism, um, abuses of the, the power structures, struggles, Luther's own personality and psychology and family dynamics, and all of those are part of the picture. But I would just say this, that God works within the context of all of those factors, including, you know, mention the printing press as well, so there's a lot going on. And it wasn't just that things just fall from on high. You know, God works within context, even the life and ministry of Jesus. Okay, one more, and then we'll... Um, yeah. uh, <clears throat> I hear you saying, like, religion can become ugly quickly. But I think that uh, bad religion can become ugly quickly, but good religion is beautiful. And I listen to... Uh, I didn't finish it yesterday, Louis Farrakhan, the, the Muslim. Yesterday he gave a two-hour sermon, and I, I'm afraid that it might become ugly very quickly. Yeah, I think my main point is that all of us, I mean, I, and I agree, good religion is beautiful. And good faith is a very powerful life-transforming experience. But it's all too easy to think that the bad religion is out there. And to say that, that we are going to go to war. And one takeaway from the, uh, even looking at the way the Reformation played out is how, how quickly divided and fragmented and combative it became. And to realize that it's a lesson for all of us, that good religion isn't about my group fighting your group as much as it is a lot of soul searching and embrace of the gospel of Jesus Christ and realizing that we all are in need of that grace. And the only chance we have is not in just saying, I'm going to be in the right tribe. It's having the right heart. The center of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, a lot of lessons from, the, from Luther, from the Reformation, from the whole way the story played out. I just pray that we'll all be able to look within and realize our need of Jesus Christ. Our need to declutter, to simplify, to understand that it's important to make the first thing the first thing. And make the center of the gospel the true center. May that be our experience. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Calvin. Next week, we're going to do what, the Babylonian captivity? No, oh. an appeal to the German nobility, and it's going to be a reading seminar, okay? We are going to read it together. It's not going to be a lecture. I will send you the link, and um, I will also send you some excerpts.